Yep. Bye, Professor. See ya. Have a good weekend.
All right, it's uh, 5.30, let's go and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Good, 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 good to hear. Okay, all right, so uh, so today's a new day. Um, so uh, I think we left off kind of in the middle of something last time. So we're gonna finish up um, kind of where we left off on Gauss quadrature. Uh, so the last thing we have to uh, is to learn is how do we can apply Gauss quadrature to any integral or for, for any integration bounds. Um, so we'll do that today. We have an example for that. Uh, but for the majority of today, we're actually going to be doing a, a, it's another MATLAB day. So we're going to be um, learning how to implement MATLAB code for solving 1D uh, finite element problems. Right? Um, so I'm hoping we can finish it up in one day. A lot of it is going to build off of uh, what we've done before in terms of the, the code uh, structure. Um, the only thing that's going to be new in the code that we haven't done before is Gauss quadrature. So, um, so actually today, today, you know, uh, we're a little bit, we're a little bit out of order just because we, uh, because of the power outage before spring break. Um, but today's actually going to work out pretty nice. And so you'll see kind of the hand calculations of how Gauss quadrature works, and then we'll get to apply it immediately in the code um, for a finite element problem. Okay. Okay. Um, Announcements. Remember the uh, the homework assignment uh, is uh, is due this uh, Sunday, I believe. So make sure you get that in on um, April fourteenth. Um, if you have any questions on it, definitely uh, let me know. Uh, I don't have any more office hours this week, but if you have questions uh, tomorrow, you can you can send me an email and uh, and I can uh, I can get back to you. Okay. All right. Any questions I can answer before we get started? Okay. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and pick up where we left off. So last time we were here. We kind of scroll up a little bit more. Okay. We introduced this idea of Gauss quadrature. So Gauss quadrature is, is a method for numerical integration. Okay. Um, so, you know, as we go through the finite element process, we, what we've found is that there are a lot of integrals that we have to take. Um, and then once we start doing 2D stuff next week, the amount of integrals that we're going to, to, to uh, need to do is going to increase, right? And so we're, we're constantly kind of doing more and more integrals. Um, and so we would like for a way to kind of make this easier on ourselves. Um, but most importantly, we're looking for a way to skip out on the calculus, right? Um, because when we're writing kind of our own code, like in MATLAB, you know, we can do linear algebra. Linear algebra is just fine. Uh, but calculus is actually pretty hard for us to do. Okay. And so the idea or kind of the, uh, the inspiration is to, is to do something like a Riemann sum, where if you have an integral, you can replace that integral or at least get the same result of the integral by doing what's known as a weighted sum, right? And so if you take your integrand and if you take your integrand, you evaluate it at certain points and you weight each of the, uh, and you weight each of the options, you sum it all together, that's gonna give you the value of your integral, okay? Okay. And so we introduced this concept of Gauss quadrature because it's, it's supposed to be kind of a very efficient way to do this weighted sum, okay? And so it's so efficient that a lot of times you only need anywhere between one to three function evaluations in order to get it to work, okay? Um, the caveat is that this only works when the integration bounds are negative one to one, right? So this Gauss quadrature only works when we're integrating between minus one and one, right? And if that's the case, it works great, right? So we did an example of that last time but for the most part, you know, we're, when we're doing our integrals, we're not going to be integrating between minus one and one. Okay, so we need a way to kind of, um, you know, make this uh, make this method a more um, more applicable, more flexible. So that's the first thing we're going to do today. Let's talk about change of variables. In Gauss quadrature. Okay. So to apply Gauss quadrature, you know, we need to have our integration bound between minus one and one. Okay. It is possible to take any integral and perform a change of variable so that your integration bounds are minus one to one.
So basically, if we take a generic integral, so let's say we're integrating from x1 to x2, okay? x1, x2 could be anything in this case, okay? And we're taking it of an integral f of x dx. Okay. If, we're, if we do our change of variables in, in a smart way, we can change this to integral between minus one to one. Okay. That's what we want. Okay. Of some f. Okay. Now we're changing the variable. So that means we're, we're not going to be integrating over x anymore. Now our integration variable is going to be something different. And so the symbol that I'm going to use for the integration variable is, is a psi. Okay? So it's this like little tornado looking thing. So we have x, f of x of psi. Okay. We need another factor in here, which is the derivative of, of x with respect to psi. Okay. And we're going to be integrating over d, d psi. So the integral on the right there, we even though you know we're we're in a different coordinate system, we're in, we're in different variables. Because the integration bounds are minus one to one, we can apply Gauss quadrature on that integral on the right. So that's good, right? That's what we want. We want to be able to take any integral, uh, apply Gauss quadrature to it, and the way we do that is performing this change of, of variables. Okay. Now, of course, you know there's the question of how do we even do this, right? In particular, it looks like we have uh, someone that came that wasn't invited to the party. So this uh, this new guy here. Uh, for all intents and purposes, you can consider this to be kind of like a uh, a convergence factor, something that we have to add to keep our uh, integrals consistent. But it actually has a name. Right? So its name is kind of like Jacob, because I think the guy who named it, who, who discovered it, was, was Jacob. But it's actually called the Jacobian. The other thing that we need that, uh, that was a, a little bit kind of flew under the radar is this right here. Okay. So this right here is our change of coordinates. So this is kind of the mapping between our original coordinate x to our Gauss coordinate z. Okay. And so we're going to learn how to how to do how to do just that. Okay, and actually that mapping is actually quite easy to make because we actually have all the tools for it already. Uh, if we kind of borrow a little bit from our finite element uh, methodology. Okay. okay, but that's where we're going. So basically, we're going to be learning how to take an integral, how to how to perform a change of coordinates, and to change it to something that you can apply a Gauss quadrature to. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. So let's see how to do that. So first, first let's establish the, the map. Okay. To establish this mapping, right? This mapping is just, you know, how do we go from, you know, one change of coordinates to the other? Uh, we're going to make use of something that we've seen before. Let's make use of our finite element shape functions. Because if you recall, you know, when, when we first introduced the shape functions, we, we, we said that one of the purposes of the shape functions was to help us kind of uh, interpolate between the solution variable and the physical coordinates, right? 
So this is not quite the same thing, but it is kind of similar, right? So we need a mapping between the Gauss coordinate xi and the physical coordinate x. Okay. And so our mapping is going to look like this. So we have x of xi is equal to x1 times n1 of xi plus x2 and 2 of xi. Okay. Where of course x1, x2, those are our original integration bounds. And n1, n2 are our shape functions. The shape functions. With the new integration bounds. Okay. The new integration bound being minus one and one. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and plug in for the expressions for n1 and n2 based on what we know already from the shape functions. And in fact, you know, because the gout, because the new um, integration bounds are known, we can actually simplify those shape functions quite a bit. Okay. All right. So let's start with n1. Okay. So our canonical definition for n1 is um, xi or x minus xi1, or excuse me, minus xi2, all divided by xi1 minus xi2. Okay. And so if you're curious where that came from, you know, we've been using this shape function before. So x uh, n1 of x is equal to x minus x2 divided by x1 minus x2. This is the exact same thing, except instead of x, I'm using xi, because these are the gauss coordinates. All right. But we can actually simplify this, because we know We know that xi2, which is the upper bound on our, on our new Gauss um, integral, is 1. And xi1 is equal to minus 1, right? Because those are the bounds of our new Gauss integral, right? So let's go ahead and plug that in. And so if we plug it in, we, we do a little bit of simplifying. We get n1 is equal to 1 half, 1 minus xi. We can do the same thing for n2. So n2 of xi, its canonical form is xi1 minus xi. Why it zoomed in like that? And it changed my pen color. All divided by xi1 minus xi2. Okay. Let's plug in. Xi1 we know is minus 1. Xi2 we know is 1. If we plug in for that, we get 1 half, 1 plus xi. So let's take these results. We know our expression for n1. We know our expression for n2. So let's go ahead and plug these back into our uh, mapping here. Okay. So that means our mapping x of xi is equal to x1 divided by 2 times 1 minus xi plus x2 divided by 2 times 1 plus xi. Any questions on, on how we got this? Uh, any any questions how we got this result here? Okay, good. So how we're going to use this mapping is that you know, eventually when we when we do our Gauss integral, we're going to be in, in integrating over xi, right? That's our integration vector. So the way we're going to use this mapping is that in our original integram f of x.
So that original integrand f of x, that's going to be a function of x. Basically, everywhere we see x, we're going to plug this in instead. Okay, but we'll see that we'll see that in an example after this. But before uh, before we, we we do an example, we do have to compute the Jacobian. Okay, remember the Jacobian kind of exists as kind of like a conversion factor between between the two. Okay. So the Jacobian is defined as the derivative of our mapping with respect to our Gauss variable. So we have dx, dxi. Okay. And so that's going to be x1, dn1, dxi, plus x2, dn2, dxi. Okay. Or we can just take the derivative of the expression above. So we take the derivative of the expression above, we get minus x1 divided by 2 plus x2 divided by 2, okay? In other words, our Jacobian dx dz is equal to x2 minus x1 divided by 2. Okay. So it's basically the difference between the original integration bounds divided by 2. All right, so let's so let's see this in, exa in, in an example so you can kind of see how this works. All right, so let's evaluate this integral. So this was an integral that we had uh, from the previous problem. So this was from our um, um, our finite element form example. This is when we were doing our um, uh, our element stiffness matrix. We came across the following integral: two hundred integral from zero to five of one plus x squared over four hundred dx. So let's evaluate this using a two-point Gauss rule. Okay. So. Let's look at this problem. So uh, we want to evaluate this with Gauss quadrature, but we can see that the integration bounds are not minus one to one, right? So they're zero to five instead. So we know that we need to perform a change of variables. Okay. So here we know x1 is equal to zero, x2 is equal to five. Those are our original integration bounds. So first thing we do, let's compute the map. So x of xi, we know is equal to, let's just scroll up here, x1 over 2 times 1 minus xi plus x2 over 2, 1 plus xi, okay? We plug in for x1, x2. Luckily, x1 is 0 here, so we have 0 over 2 times 1 minus xi plus uh, 5 over 2, one plus xi, okay? First term is just gonna cancel out because it's just a zero. And then second term, we just have five halves times one plus xi, okay? That's our x of xi. All right, so next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the Jacobian. And so this can be dx dz. And so you know you have a couple options here. So you can just now that we have the mapping, you can just take the derivative of it with respect to xi, um, or we can just plug into our original formula, which is x two minus x one divided by two. Both of you get this, both of them get the same thing, which is five halves. Okay. 
All right. So now that we have our mapping, now that we have our uh, Jacobian, let's do our change of variables, okay? So our original integral, 200. Integral from zero to five of one plus x squared over 400 dx, okay? When we perform our change of variables, that 200 is still gonna be there, okay? So it's just a constant that's outside. Performing our change of variables will change the integration bounds to minus one and one. Okay. So that's good. Now we need to convert our integrand here, okay? So everywhere we see X, everywhere we see X, we're gonna plug in our map. Okay. So we only have the, the X and one here, in one place here. We're gonna plug in our mapping here. Okay, so if we do that, we get one plus, we have x squared over two. So we know x is gonna be equal to five halves, one plus, um, one plus um, z, okay? So it's gonna be five halves, one plus z. That quantity is gonna be squared because in the original integrand that x was squared, okay? All divided by 400. So now we've eliminated x from our integrand. So now we're we're uh, we're um, integrating with respect with respect to xi. Okay. We need our Jacobian. So our Jacobian here is five over two. <laughs> and then we're now integrating over d xi. Okay, good. So we've converted our we've converted our integral now. So we've done our change of coordinates, and now that we put it in this form, where the integration bounds are minus one to one, uh, we can apply Gauss quadrature to this. And we know for a two-point rule, our two Gauss points, and so I'll call them Gauss point GP1. We know the first Gauss point is a minus one over root three, and GP2 is a positive one over root three. So we're gonna evaluate our integrand at both of those points, and our weights are just one and one. Okay, so let's do that. Um, okay, so actually, actually, first thing, let me take this Jacobian. It's just a constant, so I'm just going to apply it out in front. Okay, and so if a 200 times five over two, which is a 500. Okay. And so now we have our integrand evaluated at the two points. Okay, so we have one plus quantity five over two times one minus one over root three, quantity squared divided by 400, plus one plus quantity five over two, one um, plus one over root three, quantity squared divided by 400. So this first term right here is our integrand evaluated at the first Gauss point. And this one right here is the integrand at the second Gauss point. Notice the first term has a minus one over root three and the second term has a positive one over root three, okay? And so from here, it's just, uh, um, it's just, it's just arithmetic. And so, you know, it's, it's a little bit tedious, uh, but you can punch this into your calculator and, and you can compute its value. 
Good thing here is that we didn't have to perform any kind of antiderivatives, uh, although in this case it was a little bit trivial, but that's okay, okay? And since this was a essentially a, a quadratic function, uh, we should expect our two-point Gauss rule to give us an exact solution. So by plugging this into a calculator, we should get the exact same thing as we did before. Okay, so we do that. We evaluate this integral. What we get is 1020.80. Okay. And so if you compare this to what we got from the previous example, this is exactly the same thing. All right, so that's Gauss quadrature. And so it, it seems kind of like a, um, you know, it, when you look at like this, especially for this example, I, I know it looks kind of like a very tedious thing to do, not something that's particularly useful, but you'll see, you'll see, you'll see uh, in about, you know, 30 minutes that, you know, all of these steps, all these steps that we did, creating the mapping, computing the Jacobian, plugging into the integrand, these are all things that are very easily programmed in math, right? And so Gauss quadrature, you know, it's it's very much like FEA, and and that's why those two these two concepts are kind of joined at the hip. You know, these are these are techniques and these are processes that are you know not not that useful when you do it by hand, but when you combine it with computer and and what a computer is typically good at, um, this is a very very powerful powerful thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, the reason this answer is as accurate as the possibly, or is there any other way? Um, you know, say, oh, it's yeah, no, good, uh, good, good question. So Gauss quadrature does have its limitations. Um, so the main limitate or the, the, the situation where Gauss quadrature works really well is when your, your integrand is a, um, is a polynomial. So some function of X, X squared, X cubed, things like that. So Gauss quadrature, it actually was kind of designed from the ground up to work with polynomials. Um, and so if you were, if you were to use Gauss quadrature on a non-polynomial function, so let's say like an exponential or a sinusoid, you'll, you'll still get something decent, but the convergence rate isn't nearly as good as, as, as polynomials. Yeah. And the thing with finite elements is because our shape functions are almost always polynomials, we're just integrating polynomials. Upon. So Gauss quadrature, finite elements, you know, joined at the hip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, open up MATLAB. Um, so this activity is a little bit different, so I, I do have to go a little bit faster just because of uh, just because of the time. Um, and so unlike the last one, I, I did actually post a solution for this right away. Uh, I mean, we are going to do it um, interactively, and so if you want to follow along, you can definitely can. But if you go to week 12 of the Canvas site, you'll see that I've posted both the starter code as well as a solution, just because just you know, next week we, we kind of have to start on 2D stuff next week if we want to finish everything. So, um, so you know, if, if you want to just kind of follow along and, and kind of listen um, and, and kind of just read the solution, you can do that too. Uh, but I'm going to be kind of writing the program from scratch, kind of interactively with uh, with class here. Okay, so this uh, this set of lecture slides is all about how to implement one D boundary value problems in in math. Okay. All right, so now that we've learned about boundary value problems and we've learned about their connection with differential equations and how to solve them with FEA, um, you know, now that we have an FEA algorithm, basically we're ready to implement this in math, okay? So a lot of the concepts and a lot of the structure of the code is, is going to build off of what we've already done. Um, so, you know, we spent quite a bit of time, you know, about a month ago talking about, you know, implementation for our frame and, and trust codes. So we're going to use that almost that exact same structure um, so a lot of concepts are going to be quite familiar to you. You know, the only, the only difference is that, you know, um, because these are differential equations, there are some changes. Um, but I would say the only big difference is that, you know, um, the part about the Gauss quadrature, okay. But the timing is great because, you know, we just saw, we just saw how to do Gauss quadrature just now. And so, you know, it'll be kind of fresh in your mind as we, as we develop it. And also one nice thing about 1D problems is that we can plot the results. And in fact, you know, we actually have a, a way to find the exact answer as well. And we can compare our finite element solution to the exact solution. Okay, 
So here's the problem that we're going to be dealing with. And so it's a 1D heat transfer problem. And so it is a, uh, a straight rod here. It has a fixed length. Um, it's thermal conductivity and its area are both going to be constant. And so if you see here, both K of X and A of X, you know, they're both, you know, constants. Uh, the biggest difficulty is that we do have a thermal generation function, which is X squared. Okay. And so we need to apply Gauss quadrature to, to integrate that. that Besides that, everything else is pretty much given to you here. We have a fixed temperature at the, at the left side, a fixed temperature of 25 degrees C. So that's going to be our Dirichlet boundary condition. Our length is five meters. And our Neumann boundary condition at the right side of the, um, at the, right side of the model is 600 watts per meter squared. Okay. But again, the biggest, the biggest challenge that we're going to face for this problem is going to be the thermal generation function of X squared. Okay. All right. So now you can you can solve this problem by hand, right? And so we 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 learned you know a few weeks ago about how to solve this using the strong form um, of the differential equation, right? So you can take the strong form of the heat transfer equation, you can integrate it out and, and solve for the exact solution. We do have that here. So I've gone ahead and kind of solved for the exact solution for you. So the exact solution is T of X is equal to minus one over 60 X to the fourth plus 61 over five times X plus 25, okay? And so what we're gonna do at the end of this code is that, you know, we're, we're not gonna be solved, we're gonna be solving this using finite elements. And we're gonna be able to compare our finite element solution to the exact one um, to see how close we get basically. Okay. okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the, uh, the code here. So if you open up the starter code, you'll you'll be able to see this code here. So it's not that long. You can see it's only about 112 um, lines long. Right. And we'll uh, we'll go from there. So actually, let me switch to reading mode. Okay. So the first part of the code here is uh, we need to define the the parameters of the problem, right? So very much the same way as as our as our trust problem. So the uh, parameters for this problem, we, we define the length. We define thermal conductivity. Um, the cross-sectional area. Uh, we need to define the Dirichlet boundary condition on the left side, the um, and the heat flux on the right side. So let's go ahead and fill all those in based on this uh, based on this diagram here. So the length of the rod here is five meters, and so I'm going to plug in five for this. Okay. The thermal conductivity, the thermal conductivity is fifty watts per meter um, degree C. So let me go ahead and plug in fifty for the K. The cross-sectional area is 0 0.1, so I'm going to plug that in here. The Dirichlet boundary temperature on the left side, T0, is 25 degrees C, so I'm going to plug that in right here. The Neumann boundary condition, the heat flux out the right side, is 600 watts per meter squared, so I'm going to plug in 600. Okay. okay. Let me go ahead and, and, and pause here for, uh, for a second. All right. So the last thing that we're specifying in this, in this top section is uh, something that we didn't specify before, um, just because, you know, when we did direct stiffness um, problems, you know, the number of elements that we had was kind of, was kind of fixed. It was kind of dependent on the geometry. But what we're gonna see in this, uh, in this code right here is we can actually modify how many elements that we have and our code is going to basically update based on that. So let me kind of draw it out for you just so you can see. So, you know, in our domain here, our domain is basically a line, right? We have a 1D domain. We have our endpoints here and here. Okay. The number of elements is going to determine, you know, how many um, how many segmentations we uh, we break this up into, right? And so let's say that we want to break this up into into four elements, right? And so four elements we do one dot here, dot here, and dot here. Okay. And so we basically broke up our domain into four different elements. So it's element A, B, C, and D. Okay. And so in that particular case, we want to set the number of elements here to four. But the way we're going to write this code is that we can we can actually you know this is actually going to be flexible depending on how we change the uh, um, how we change the number of elements. So let's say that you know because we we know we we've, we've known from ANSYS that the more elements that you include in your mesh or more elements that you include in your formulation, 
the more accurate solution is going to be. Okay. So instead of four elements, you know, maybe we want to solve this with 400 elements instead, right? And so we, we include more dots in here to make it, you know, 400 different elements. And the beauty of this code, or, or kind of the nice thing about how this code is written, is that it's going to be able to use the same code no matter how many elements that we that we specify. Okay. Which is basically exactly the same in ANSYS, how ANSYS is defined, right? So if you think back to how we use ANSYS for, for activities one and two, right? If you change the mesh, you know, ANSYS kind of automatically adapted your solution to how, however many elements are in your mesh. And this is gonna be exactly the same thing. Okay? So we're gonna change the number of elements and, we're, and we can actually see how the solution is going to depend on the number of elements. Okay, but for now, just for simplicity, let me leave this at 10. Uh, and then we'll, we'll we can experiment from there. Okay. All right. So the next thing that we uh, that we defined, if you recall from our our frame and trust code, was our connectivity matrix. Okay. So our connectivity matrix basically told us which elements were connected to which nodes, right? And that was a really important piece of information when we went to go assemble our our global linear system. Okay. Um, we don't have that here, and so you're going you're to notice that the connectivity matrix is missing in this code, uh, only because in the 1D case, the, um, the connectivity is pretty trivial, right? And so the way that we number this, we're, we're going to number all of, our, all of our elements one through whatever from left to right, okay? And our nodes are also going to be numbered from left to right as well, okay? So whatever element that you're in, so let's say that you're in element I, so where I can be number six, right? So the node on the left-hand side is gonna be the same, same number as the node, right? And then the node on the right-hand side is gonna be I plus one, okay? So we, we don't have any connectivity matrix here only just because our mesh structure is, is pretty trivial, okay? But don't forget about the connectivity matrix. And so when we get to the final project, you know, connectivity matrix is gonna come back. So, you know, make sure you kind of understand that. Just, but just for now, you know, just because this is a relatively simple case, we're going to leave. We're going to leave it off, and uh, we're going to we're going to basically hard code this into our assembly. Okay. Next, we have data containers, and so we need data containers for all of our matrices and vectors. And so you can see here that we have um, data containers for the global um, global stiffness matrix and the global um, um, forcing vector. Okay, and we also have data containers for the element stiffness matrices. You can see our element stiffness matrices here are two by two. Okay, and then something that's new that we didn't have before is we need to compute element forcing vectors, right? And so you can see that we've created a data container for this one as well. Okay, so you know these, you know, exact same, basically the exact same, um, you know, structure that we had from before, um, except you know, of course, the sizes are adjusted for for this types of problems, and um, we have the element forcing vector as well. Okay. Oops, wrong. One. Okay. All right, next thing that we need. So next thing we need is we actually need to specify the X and Y coordinates of every node in the mesh, okay? And so we didn't need to do this uh, in the direct stiffness uh, method just because just because of the way the, 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 the matrix is formulated. But uh, as we go about this method and as we do our integrals, we need to know the positions of every single node, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And so the way we're gonna store this is, is we're gonna store it as a vector. And in fact, we're going to make use of a special function within MATLAB called linspace, which evenly spaces out um, all of the uh, all the points. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And so let's come back to the uh, let's come back to the code here. And so our position vector is going to be linspace. So if you've never used linspace before, or if, if if it's been a while, you know linspace takes three arguments. And so the first element of, uh, of lint space is going to be the start. So that's the first entry in, in the lint space. Okay. And so for us, we're going to start our count at zero, okay? Because we're assuming that the x coordinate of the node on the left here is x is equal to zero, okay? And then for the second entry in lint space, it's going to be the final entry, which in our case is going to be the total length of our rod, okay? So the second entry in lint space here is going to be L. And then the last entry in, in lint space is going to be the number of points that you want to, to do. Okay. Now this last part here is a little bit tricky because we need to specify how many nodes are, are in our mesh. Okay. 
So if we look at a typical mesh right here, you can see that this mesh here has 11 elements, right? Those are all of the, uh, the numbers in parentheses. And if you count the number of nodes, you can see that the number of nodes is, you know, 11 plus one, which is 12. So in a 1D case like this, the number of nodes is always, always going to be one plus the number of elements, right? We've already defined a, a vector, or we've already defined a variable here to define the number of elements, which is n ln, right? So let's use that same number here. Okay. But we're going to do n ln plus one, right? Because that's 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 to make sure that we have enough nodes for all of the all the entries. Okay, and then the next thing we're going to define here, just to make things a little bit simpler, uh, we're going to define the length of each element. Okay, and so of course the assumption that we're making here is that we are assuming that all elements are the same size. Okay. That's kind of what we noted up here as well. So the length of the element here is going to be the total, um, the total length L divided by the number of elements. So all, all elements are going to be the same. Okay. Any questions on uh, any questions on that? Yeah. Um, I don't feel like we're going to assume that we're size. Uh, I'm assuming there's cases that we don't want that. Yeah. We're going to more concentrated towards an area that's of more interest than this. Yeah. But is that something we might consider later in the uh, So in uh, when we do our final project, um, we're going to do it on a 2D, 2D mesh. And so those the on the 2D mesh, the elements are all going to be slightly different sizes from each other. And so we'll definitely account for it then. But if you did want to do it in the 1D case, you would, you would basically kind of build this manually. And so instead of doing the lens space here, first of all, we, we wouldn't we probably wouldn't even have this, this uh, entry here because every element's going to be a different, different size. And so this pause vector here, you know, you would just do it manually, like zero. You know, maybe you want to concentrate things close by. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. 0.5, and then maybe you go one, two, three, four, like that. So that way you concentrate more, more elements kind of near the beginning. And so in this case, what we would do is that, you know, when we construct our element stiffness matrix, we would, you would compute the element size um, kind of on the fly for each particular element. <clears throat> but yeah, it's a good, it's a good question and, and definitely something we'll factor into 2D and of course in 3D as well, because of the factor as well. Uh, okay, any other questions on, on this? Cool. Okay. So that's all the uh, that's all the intro stuff. And so you know that's that's defining all our, our variables there. So now let's actually go, get to computing. Okay. So the next thing that we need to compute here are the element stiffness matrices. Okay. So the element stiffness matrices for a 1D boundary value problem is given by this integral here. So that's that's you know that's the you know, that, that kind of goes back to the first example we did on Tuesday, right? So you evaluate this integral, um, you know, that gives you your two by two element stiffness matrix, right? So you have integral from x1 to x2 of column vector dn1 dx, dn2 dx times ka times row vector dn1 dx, dn2 dx, okay? And then the multiplication of these two vectors together will give you your, um, your two by two matrix. And then you integrate the, um, the ka to give you your, your factor, okay? So it's a lot of steps to do, but let's let's kind of break this down kind of step by step. All right, first thing. First thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna compute the um, the derivatives of the shape functions. Okay? But remember, we're using linear shape functions here. So N1, if you remember, N1 is X minus X2 divided by x1 minus x2 and n2 is equal to um, x1 minus x divided by um, x1 minus x2. Okay. Those are just our standard kind of linear shape functions that we've, that we've kind of been working. Okay. And so of course, when you take the derivatives of these, you get um, um, you get constant values, right? Because we only have just one x there. And if we, if you, if you kind of um, take into account that the length of the element L e um, is nothing more than just um, x two minus x one, right? 
That's just the difference between the left and right, uh, the right and left coordinate of the element. And so that gives us the length. And so we can, we can actually simplify the expressions for these shape function derivatives. Okay. And so dn1 dx is nothing more than just minus one over LE and dn2 dx is just one over LE. Okay. So let's, uh, so let's, let's form those, uh, those, those, uh, those expressions in the code. Okay. So if you come back to the code, you can see here that we have an expression for dn1 and dn2. Okay. So we can compute those values based on the length of the element. Let's go ahead and do that here. So dn1 is going to be a minus one divided by LLM. So that's the um, that's the variable for the length of the element that we defined up there. And then dn2 is going to be one divided by um, LLM. Okay. And that's based just purely on purely on this. Now, if you did have a situation where your mesh was uh, was different sized, um, you know, you didn't have a constant element, uh, you didn't have a constant element size, you would basically modify the code here where you would uh, first compute the length of this particular element. And use that computed length here. But because we're assuming all the elements are the same size, we can just put drop in the length of the element right there. Right. Okay. Next, next thing we're going to do is we're going to form our vectors here. Okay. And so the first thing we're going to form is the column vector. So column vector is dn1 dx, dn2 dx. Okay. We're just going to drop that in here. So we have dn1. We're using a semicolon because remember, semicolon basically tells MATLAB to go to the next row. And this is going to be dn2. Okay. Next, we're going to have the row vector. So the row vector is going to be dn1. Okay. We're using a comma in this case because a, a, a comma basically tells MATLAB to stay on the same row of the matrix. And then dn2. Okay. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply these two vectors because we're, we're gonna multiply them to get our two by two matrix. And so we're gonna do just, uh, we're gonna take advantage of the fact that MATLAB can actually do matrix matrix multiplication. And so we're just gonna simply do column vec times row vec, okay? And so since the column vector is a two by one and the row vector is a one by two, when you multiply these two together, you'll get a two by two matrix, okay? And then you're going to multiply. So because in this um, because in this uh, um, integration here, you know, our k and a in this case is a constant, right? We just happen to pick a problem where we have a constant thermal conductivity and a constant cross-sectional area, right? And so since the since all of these um, you know shape function derivatives are also constant, you know, when you integrate, you're just going to end up with just the length of the element itself, okay? Right, so you're going to be performing this integral here, which is x1 to x2 times ka, right? And so since the ka is a constant, the ka is going to cancel out. And then you're going to just be integrating just dx. And when you integrate dx, you get integral from x1, x2, dx, okay? This is equal to, this is an integral we can actually do by, by hand. This is, this is a very simple integral. So there's no need for Gauss quadrature here, okay? We end up with just x2 minus x1. Okay. And we know x2 minus x1, which is just the length of the element. Okay. We have L E. And so we've we've just computed this part here, right? So we just we've multiplied our column vector and row vector together to get this two by two matrix. And then so to complete the element stiffness matrix, we need to multiply by K, we need to multiply by A, and we need to multiply by the length of the element, which is the result that we got from the integral, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And so this, uh, um, this line right here is gonna be perform the integration. And so we're gonna have KE is equal to KE multiplied by K times A, times the length of the element.
Now, if your K and A, if they if they change as a function of X or if they if they were functions, you would have to perform Gauss quadrature here. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. But for but for this case, because everything is a constant, there's there's no need for Gauss quadrature. You just evaluate everything just um, analytically. Okay, and then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to save this result. So just like we did with the truss uh, with the truss and um, uh, and frame codes, we're going to save this out. Okay, we're going to use the colon notation. So colon notation means to save everything to this um, in that row or column. Okay, and we're going to do it for this particular element i underscore e. And this is going to be set equal to the element stiffness matrix that we just computed, K underscore. Okay. All right. So this, so this, uh, so this loop looks a little bit different. And so, you know, um, if you think back, if you think back to the parallel code that we did for the trust and frame code, you know, when we computed our element stiffness matrices, we just plugged it straight into a form, right? We had our frame formula, which was kind of massive. And then our trust formula, which is kind of a bit more, um, a bit more reasonable. So this does the exact same thing as that code. Just the way that we get here is a little bit different because of the uh, because of the integral. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this part here? Cool. All right. Next, we have the the all new portion here, which is the element forcing vector. Okay. Now, our element forcing vector is this expression right here, right? So the element forcing vector is integral from x1 to x2 on the particular element, multiplied by the shape functions n1 and 2, multiplied by the, um, by the thermal generation function dx, okay? And then we have that additional term on the right, which is the term for the Neumann boundary condition, right? n1, n2 times a times q out, Evaluated at x is equal to x sub h. Okay. Now, remember the Neumann boundary condition term is only relevant for the for the element that has the Neumann boundary condition. So for now, let's ignore this. Okay, we'll come back to this uh, in a bit, and let's kind of focus on this first integral. Right. All right. So let's go ahead and plug in. Uh, we'll plug in for n one of x, n two of x, and s of x. And so we, we, we know what N1 and N2 are. We've, we've already seen them, okay? The only difference here is that S of X for this problem, our thermal generation function is X squared, okay? So we plug everything in. And so we know N1 of X is one over LE times X2 minus X. And then N2 is X minus X1 divided by LE, okay? So we have that uh, length of the element, the LE comes out in front. And then all we're left with is x2 minus x1, and then x1, x minus x1, okay. or x2 minus x, and then x minus uh, x1. Okay. And then we have our thermal generation function x squared, okay? If you distribute this through, so if you take this x squared, you distribute it through every entry in the vector, what you get is this. So you have the integral from x1 to x2 of x squared times x2 minus x cubed, and then x cubed minus x1 x squared dx. Okay. You know, again, don't let the don't let the integral on the uh, on the on the vector um, intimidate you, right? All this basically means that we're going to be integrating each entry of this of this vector separately. Okay. Okay. Now we have this one D integral, and uh, we very much can compute it by hand. And so you know, one D integrals usually are not that big a deal, but just to, but just to kind of drive a point home. You know, let's let's use this as practice for Gauss quadrature. You know, more importantly, let's see how how Gauss quadrature is uh, is implemented in this case. Okay. So the first step in using Gauss quadrature is to decide how many Gauss points that we want to use. Okay. And so we we saw on the table that we have formulas for one Gauss point, two Gauss point, and three Gauss points. For this problem, you know, because we have a cubic function. Um, you know, let's use two Gauss points. Okay? Um, that should that should give us some pretty good um, accuracy. Okay? Um, so technically speaking, you know, uh, if you want to integrate a cubic function exactly, you do need three Gauss points. But using two Gauss points will give us plenty of accuracy. Right? And so this it's usually not usually beyond two Gauss points is usually a little bit over. Okay. Okay. So let's come to the code and let's see how this entire group is structured right here. 
All right, so first thing we, we need to define the gauge point. So this is a GP1 and GP2, okay? So for a two point gauge rule, So for two point gauge rule, the first gauge point is minus one divided by square root of three. And the second gauge point is one divided by square root of three. Okay. So these are just the gauge points for a two point gauge rule. Now, if we had three point, a three point gauge rule, you know, we do three of these, okay? So actually you can look up I, I almost never use a three-point Gauss rule in my own work. But if you were to use a three-point Gauss rule, the first Gauss point would be minus square root of three divided by five. Okay. Second Gauss point would be zero. And third Gauss point would be a positive square root three over so just refer back to the table that we that we made before. Okay. And the other thing you would have to keep in mind here is you'd have to keep track of the weights. Right? One nice thing about using a two-point Gauss rule is that the weights are one, so we don't need to we don't need to keep track. Okay, well, let me go ahead and change these back. So the Gauss first Gauss point is minus one over square root three. Second Gauss point is a positive one over square root. Okay, next thing we need to do is we need to input the nodal coordinates for this element, okay? Now remember, every element has a different no has different nodal coordinates, right? So let's go back to this uh, go back to this diagram here, okay? So we're going to be constructing, we're basically using a loop to construct every single um, every single element forcing vector for each element, right? But every element has different nodes attached to it. Okay? So remember at the beginning, we define this vector called the position vector, okay? Now it's time to kind of make use of that, right? So remember the position vector keeps track of the coordinates of every single node in our mesh, okay? And based on the connectivity information, we know which node numbers are being attached to. So for example, we know that for this particular element, and remember we're inside a loop, so we're, we're using IE here, right? We know that the position of the left node f x one is going to be pause vector at i e. Okay. The position vector of the second node is going to be pause vector at i e plus one. And we know that because of the connectivity information, right? So we know that the uh, for each element i, the left node is uh, has has a has an index i. And the right node has an index i plus one. Okay. And so we're basically calling this position vector at those two locations, i e and i e plus one. Okay. Let me let me pause here for a second. Any any questions on, on this so far? Good. Okay, next thing we need to do is we need to compute the x quantities at the Gauss points. Okay. So this is this is where we're going to use the, the map. X of Z. Okay. So if you look back at the example, the first example that we did today, right? One of the first things that we did was we used we used the mapping x x of Z is equal to n one of Z times x one plus n two of Z times x two. Okay. And so we need to compute, you know, in order to perform an integral, what is the x coordinates at the Gauss points? So let me make another comment here. Our mapping in this case is x of psi is equal to x1 times n1 of psi plus x2 times n2 of psi, okay? So we're kind of doing two steps in one right here. So we're not only reforming the mapping, but we're also evaluating the mapping at our Gauss points where our gauge points are GP1 and GP2. Okay, okay so let's go and do that. So XGP1, 
So let's plug in our let's plug in our um, our mapping here, right? So x x gp one here's gonna be x one times n one of gp one okay? plus x two times n two of gp uh, one. Remember, this is this is the x coordinate of the first Gauss point. So you're plugging in GP1 for both for both distances. Okay? And then for x GP2, this is going to be x1 times n1 at GP2 plus x2 times n2 at GP2. So there's a lot of ones and twos here going on. So make sure you kind of know kind of why we're doing each one. Okay. Now, of course, you know, um, we're using N1, N2 here, but we haven't actually defined what those are. So we need to, uh, we also need to plug in for the shape functions. Okay. So if you look back at the first example we did today, we know that N1 of Xi, when we're using it for Gauss quadrature is equal to one half times one minus Xi, and n2 of xi is equal to one half times one plus xi. Okay. So let's plug in those expressions. Where everywhere we see xi, we're going to plug in gp1 or gp2. Okay. So I'm going to take this expression right here, n1 at gp1, and I'm going to plug in one half times one minus gp1. And then N2 at GP1 is going to be one half times one plus GP1. Same thing for down here, but instead of GP1, I'm going to plug in GP2. So this would be one half times one minus GP2. And then um, this one here is going to be one half times one plus GP2. We did kind of two steps here. So we basically, we implemented our mapping and then inside the mapping, we evaluated uh, we evaluated at the, the two Gauss points, okay? All right. But there's a lot going on in that step. Any, any questions on, any questions on that? Okay, good. It's gonna, it's, it'll take it'll take a bit of time to sink in. So you know, definitely, if when you're going back and you're kind of referencing this code, you know, definitely, you know, read this line again and, and see. Um, you know, this is this is probably the the most difficult part to do. Okay, now let's do the Jacobian. So the Jacobian, uh, we know for um, for one D integrals, Jacobian is equal to x two minus x one divided by two. So let's just go ahead and plug that in because we know x1 and x2, we've already retrieved that from the position vector. So let's do x2 minus x1 divided by two. All right. So now we're ready. We, we've done all the setup for the problem. So now let's actually go in and, and perform the integral. Okay. okay, so let me go back to the slides down here. Okay, so the integral that we actually want to perform is, is this one right here, right? So this here, we have our shape function. These are our shape functions back in the normal coordinates, right? And then we have, um, when, we plug in, when, we, when we factor in this x squared, this top integral is x squared uh, times x2 minus x cubed, okay? So we're actually gonna perform, so we're performing two integrals here. Like we need to perform an integral on the top um, entry and an integral on the bottom entry. So we're gonna do these kind of one by one, okay? So let's do the top entry first, okay? So the top entry, um, top entry we're gonna integrate x squared times x2 minus x cubed, okay? So let me go ahead and leave that as a comment here. Top integral. Um, oh, it's actually one over L E times 
um, x squared times x2 minus x cubed. Okay. So that's the first integral that we need to do. Now, since we're doing this with Gauss quadrature, we need to multiply this by the Jacobian as well. Okay, so this next line is, is, is gonna be a mess, but, uh, but, you know, but just kind of keep all that in mind. So first thing I'm going to do is because this is going to be just an arithmetic expression, I'm going to take the Jacobian that we just computed, okay, and I'm, I'm going to divide it by the length of the element. So we're going to divide by L, ln, okay. So that takes care of the Jacobian, and that takes care of this factor here as well. So all we have left to do here is just evaluating just this integrand here um, at our two gauge points, okay. Okay. So we need to do this twice, right? So we're doing this, we're, we're doing a two-point rule. So everything here, we need to evaluate at Gauss point one and at Gauss point two, right? So let's evaluate everything at Gauss point one first. So Gauss point one is gonna be X GP one, okay? That's what we just computed up here, squared. Right? And then we're gonna multiply this by X two. It's a little bit confusing because x actually should the x the, the coordinates of the element actually show up in the integral itself, but we're integrating basically x squared times x2. That's why we have x gp1 squared times x2. And then from that, we're going to subtract x cubed. So this is going to be x gp1 cubed. All right, so what, what I have here, so this this what I have so far is this is our integrand. This is our integrand at the first Gauss point. So that's good. But in order to compute the Gauss uh, quadrature, we need to add to get add to this the same integrand at the second Gauss point. So I'm going to add this to, and I'm just going to copy and paste. And so this is going to be the exact same thing as here. But I'm going to do it at GP2 instead. So this right here is the integrand at the second Gauss point. We have kind of two, two clusters of terms. So we have this term and then this term. Okay. It's the same integrand we just evaluated at different, different Gauss points. And of course, you know, we need to include the, the Jacobian. And then this one over LN, LM became just, it was just an artifact from the original. All right. So again, you know, kind of a lot going on here, but that's 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 kind of the uh, thing. Any questions on kind of how we set up that uh, that line of code there? Okay, good. All right. So that's the first integral there. So the second integral or the bottom integral is one over LE multiplied by we're just going to go to the bottom expression here. So that's x cubed minus x1 times x squared. Okay. So this is x cubed minus x1 times x squared. Okay. So let's implement that here. So just like we did for the top entry, we need to multiply by the Jacobians. We have the Jacobian divided by the length of the element okay. times. Our integrand here is uh, we're starting with x cubed, so we have x gp1 cubed minus x1 times x gp1 squared. Okay. 
So once again, right here, what we have is the integrand evaluated at the first Gauss point. Okay, and then to that, we're going to add the same thing into the second Gauss point. So let me just go ahead and copy and paste here. Copy this, paste here. Okay. It's going to replace all the GP1 with GP2s. Once again, this is the second Gauss point. Okay. Same integrand, second Gauss point. And if you notice how I formatted the code, you can see here that the first entry in the element forcing vector is the first integral, and the second in entry in the element forcing vector is the second. Okay, so I just kind of did each entry of the vector kind of one by one. Okay, good. So that part right there takes care of the element forcing vector for the thermal generation term. Okay, so the last thing we need to do here before we exit this loop is we need to apply the Neumann boundary condition on the right edge, okay? Now, if we go back to our problem statement, right? Our Neumann boundary condition is only being uh, applied on the rightmost side of our domain. And so this is only applied on the rightmost element. The rightmost element has the highest element number. Okay? And so you can see here that I've used an if statement. And so this if statement means that we're only going to apply the boundary condition if we're on the right edge. Okay? So this only occurs on the rightmost element. And so this is if IE is equal to N LM. Okay? And then we're going to be evaluating this term right here. So we have N1, N2 um, times A times Q out. Okay. But notice that this is only evaluated at the at the right hand side. Okay. So if you plug in, right? So if we know our expressions for N1, N2, and we plug in the very most x coordinate there, what you're actually going to see is that you know, because of how things cancel out, we're going to get zero for N1 and then one for N2. A here is constant and Q out is constant, so we don't need to change those. And so the only entry that we have to add here is for the second, the second entry of the, the force and vector. Okay. Okay, so let's see how that's implemented in the code. All right. So if you see here, you know, when I when I write this code here, I've only left room for just one entry here. Okay. So this is going to be a, I'm going to put two there, which means for the second entry in the in the element forcing vector. And then to that, I'm going to add um, A times Q out, which is the value of the Neumann boundary condition at that. At that. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on that? Okay. So we are, we are just about out of time. We just have two minutes left. Uh, but that covers basically all the new stuff. And so from here, you just work on assembly. Uh, and, and I and you know, looking at your guys' um, activity too, so I just graded those yesterday. It looks like uh, looks like mostly everyone's getting the assembly part. So that's that's good. Um, so I'll, I'll let you I'll let you guys uh, work on the assembly on your own. Um, and the Dirichlet boundary condition is the same as well. But let me go ahead and show you the final result. Let me go ahead and download this here. Okay. So this here has everything kind of implemented into it. So this is kind of the finished code right here. So you can see the assembly and the um, and the Dirichlet boundary conditions were implemented. Let me show you what happens when you run the code. So let me actually change this to five elements just so you can see. I'm gonna go ahead and run this code. Okay. So you can see here I've I've produced two lines right here. So in red, uh, in red is the exact solution, and blue is the finite element solution. So actually, let me make this a bit small just so you can see. So if we change this to only three elements, you can see even with three elements, we do a pretty good job of approximating the exact solution, right? So the blue and the red are basically almost on top of each other. But as we increase the number of elements, so let's say we increase this to 30, we get basically exact matching between the two, right? And this code is actually flexible enough to, to, uh, to adjust however many elements that you have. 
So this is the solution with two elements. So you can see that you know there's there's some mismatch here. So we go up to 20 elements, then it uh, it improves. Okay. All right, and so that's that's all we got time for today. So definitely you know definitely check out this code. I've, I've already given you the solution to it, so you can you can check it out on your own. Um, definitely go over the assembly and the drift and boundary conditions. When we come back uh, next week, um, I'll have the final project ready for you guys, so we can uh, we can we're going we're going to talk about that. And we're going to start our discussion on 2D um, general finite elements. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for coming today. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Hope you guys have a good weekend. And I will see you guys next week. What's up? Um, I've seen my home, um, and I got an eight out of hundred. Yeah. And I want to know. I did all the problems. I did all the one through five. Yeah. And you can use the code. I suppose that I, I kind of missed my format. Up, so I published the code. Eight problems. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what? Concert? Concert? Yeah. Which one? Uh, a friend of um, mine. Yeah. But oh, it's not like a. Is it like two people contest? Uh, is that a Japanese? Uh, uh, yeah. So I was, I was mostly like yeah. more. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, 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 I was mostly. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. I've heard. I've never really seen. Yeah. I saw. I saw. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't see. I mean, the setup. So you want to release it in by gas, futuristic, yeah, that's okay. Cool. Yeah, it's just email to me. It's in here, it's just formatted. That's how it starts. starts oh, wow. That's why I was asking. Nice. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So it's like I can see where the yeah, I mean, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I couldn't find both the code. That's why. Uh, well, I, 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 if you want to tell me your your one, just tell me both your codes. Yeah, yeah take a look and then I'll I'll address you. Yeah, of course. Thanks, you appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's Benny. You had a question about the homework. Yeah, like there. Um, yeah. You noticed this one word. I hope so. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, so we're we're uh, doing the homework. I think the problem was it four A. No. Um. Well, which one? Four. The one with the elements and like the. Uh, yeah. Well, four A and four B have elements. So uh, the problem four. Um, you said to separate the problem into four elements. Yeah. Um, which you mean five nodes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess we were wondering. We looked at you through your notes, and uh, you did one example where you have zero. We have three nodes. We have x equals zero, x equals five, yeah. and we have one in here at x equals twenty. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we wanted to know um, when we approach the problem on homework, should we evenly space out the yeah. nodes? Just evenly space it out. I, the only reason I did it like this just because um, you know, I, I wanted to show you what it would look like if you had different spaced elements. Yeah. But when I tell you just you know four elements, the, the assumption is that you just you just evenly space. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Then yeah. that that's pretty much it. Okay. Um. Okay, I think it was 3A. Mm -hmm. uh, it says to reference oh, yeah. um, another problem. Uh, oh, did I uh, leave that in there? Well, uh, it says to reference um, two, I think it's 2A. Um, but that one has a two um, fixed positions at the ends. Yeah. Um, we just didn't know how to approach it. Yeah. No, you could you could definitely do that. So all the examples we did in class, we only had one fixed position. Yeah. yeah. But when you're doing a weak form solution, right? The first, before you even get to the integral, like you have your t of x is you know a zero plus a one x plus a two x squared, right? Yeah. Yeah. You apply one of the conditions there, you get rid of you know one of these things. Yeah. So when you have two, you basically apply both conditions on this before you even get started on the on the mm -hmm. integral. So you're just applying both conditions on directly onto this. And then you're just solving. And then when you do the integral, you just solve for whatever stuff, which is probably just going to be one. Interesting. Yeah. OK. So would the both conditions would be applied to the at the same time? Exactly. Yeah. Oh. So you apply it. So, so you, you have to do it for both T and for W. Yeah. How do the, how do the temperatures factor in there? Um, so, the, so for the temperatures, right? Like you have like, you know, T. T now was 10, TL was 65. Yeah, 10 is T of L 65. Yeah. So the way you would apply that is you would say, you know, T of zero is equal to 10, right? T yeah. equals A naught. Which equals A naught. Yes. Right? So that's good. That, that part we, we managed to get, it was the 65 that got us. Yeah. So you won't be able to solve for both. And so I think that's, that's kind of what um, makes people a little bit uneasy. So you have 65 is equal to A1 
times L plus A2 times L squared. Yeah. 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 So you won't be able to solve for both of these, but you can still eliminate one because if you divide both sides by L, okay, mm -hmm. by L is equal to A1 plus A2 L. We thought the A naught would also be applied to this. Equation. Oh, it is. It is. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, uh, I we just that. Yeah, we didn't <laughs> know if uh, we plugged in 10 or if we plugged in A naught. Uh, you do. You do. You oh, do. you plug in 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because the because the a naught's already solved. You know yeah. What a naught is. Okay. Yeah. And so um, you won't be able to solve for a one or a two, but you should be able to get an expression where a one is in terms of a two. Exactly. So six sixty five yeah. divided by l minus ten minus a two times l. Okay. And so then you can plug that in there. So you just have one more unknown constant, and then you would basically integrate to solve for that. Okay. Same thing for the w. So the w you have w of zero is equal to zero. So that means B zero is equal to zero. And then you have W of L is equal to zero. So same thing, you won't be able to solve for B1, B2 yeah. outright, but you should be able to solve for B1 in, in terms of in terms of B2. That okay. Makes sense. Yeah. okay, that helps out a ton. I want to take a picture of this. Sure, of course. Thank you, questions. Take that. Mm -hmm.